Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Paris, to l'Ecole, the School of Jewelry Arts, for our new lecture online on the French crown jewels, past and present. It's an extremely passionate a story that's full of passion and adventure, and we hope you'll enjoy it. L'Ecole was, was created in 2012 and the, with the support of Van Cleef and Arpels, and the whole idea of L'Ecole is to open up the world of jewelry, jewelry culture, jewelry history, gemology, savoir-faire, and we're very pleased to be home tonight in our home campus in Paris. By the way, I don't know if you realize, but L'Ecole is open to all. It's not a degree program. You can come all ages almost. We even have uh, workshops for children, etc. So. Where are we right now? We're very lucky to be in the antechamber of the library. We're going to have our talk tonight in the library. 7,000 works on jewelry, jewelry history, exhibitions, etc. We're very happy about that tonight. Here, we're actually, this is another aspect of L'Ecole research. One of the major research projects recently was on the fabulous diamonds of Jean-Baptiste Tavernier this great French merchant of the 17th century who wrote about his travels. They became a bestseller in the 17th century. And it was an international project to recreate 20 of the most beautiful diamonds that he sold to the Sun King, Louis XIV. There was a Canadian lapidary. It was the Museum of Natural History in France, L'Ecole itself. And based on unprecedented historical documents, they were able to create very exact replicas of these 20 diamonds. And this, this actually falls nicely into our transition because last week we had, or a few weeks ago, in the Museum of Natural History, there was a lecture on the French blue. So tonight you'll hear a little bit about the French blue. Uh, for those of you who followed three weeks ago, you know the story. And here, within these replicas in cubic zirconia, we have one of the most, let's say, true uh, representations of the French blue as it existed when it was purchased by Louis XIV, when, when it arrived from India. So it's extremely a historical document. L'Ecole was able to create two sets. One of the sets was given to the Museum of Natural History, and the other is here for you all to enjoy, I hope, when you can all come see us in Paris. Now, I'm also pleased to announce I'll be speaking with my esteemed colleague and friend, Léonard Puy. He's actually a doctor in art history. He's a researcher at L'Ecole and a teacher. And one of his great specialties is the pearl trade in the early 20th century, from the Gulf uh, to Paris, etc. And I'm very pleased to go join him right now, uh, without further ado, for our talk tonight on the French crown jewels, past and present. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, at L'Ecole. Um, I am uh, Leonard Pouy, and it's an uh, absolute pleasure and an honor to have you to talk to you tonight about this wonderful uh, uh, subject. Uh, it's a research that we've been uh, uh, doing, that we've been working on with Paul since uh, a few time now. And it's quite a, a, large, a larger subject, as you, as you can tell. Um, it's almost like 500 uh, uh, years. Huh? We're going to talk about, in one hour today, we're going to travel through time, through space also, as, we're gonna, as you're going to see. Quite a long story, quite a fantastic one, very rocambolesque, as we say in French. Lots of uh, peripécies, lots of adventures, lots, lots, lots of crazy events. Uh, some may seem unbelievable also. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, sadly, we won't be able to talk about every one of the Royal Crown Jewels. We can try to pick uh, some of our favorites. There were fights also between Paul and, and, and I uh, to choose uh, and to talk about uh, uh, most of them. But uh, it's actually quite a, an interesting story. It's quite a complex story also that is uh, deeply uh, uh, associated with the history of, of France and Europe also. And um, strangely enough, there was not so many books on this subject. There's not been so many research on, on such a topic. And uh, actually, most of what we know today about the royal crown jewels of France, about it, their history, uh, we own it to one man. Uh, who's uh, called Germain Babst. And Germain Babst was uh, actually the, the very last uh, heir of a, a long dynasty of jewelers that were actually the last one to work for the Royal Crown Jewels Institution in the Second Empire in France. But he was uh, not so much interested by uh, jewelry making himself, he was more interested in the history of jewelry. 
and he wrote this uh, fantastic book uh, published in 1889, The History of the Royal Crown Jewels of France, only two years only after those uh, uh, jewels were, we thought at that time, lost forever. You're going to know uh, everything about it. No spoilers. No spoiler yet. So let's start, let's dive into this very rich history together. Well, as Leonard said, we have 500 years of history in a little less than an hour. So we're going to give you some signposts to carry you along our journey. First of all, we'd like to explain to you why was this institution of the Crown Jewels created? For what reasons and who created it? We'll also look at the acquisitions, the additions to this set of jewels from the Ancien Régime, so from the 16th century onward. How were these jewels acquired and what happened to them? And in the third chapter, we'll look at a little more of a funny uh, chapter, fun chapter, where we'll look at some of the misfortunes, some of the adventures of the jewels that they've been through. It's a very interesting uh, and fascinating part of the history of the French crown jewels. And finally, we'll look at the destiny of the crown jewels. Of course, a few examples of jewels that of, of, of which we know the existence today. So let's, let's begin. Uh, uh, and let's dive into the origins of this institution. Actually, the Royal Crown Jewels of France were the first crown, crown jewels uh, uh, per se, and we uh, owe uh, this uh, idea to one man, uh, Francis I, King Francis I, who had this genius idea to make, to build a collection of jewelry uh, inalienable, which, which means that uh, they were not uh, allowed to be uh, sold at that time by any king, uh, as powerful as you are. Uh, uh, and uh, so he made this collection, he, he, chose, he picked a, a certain uh, uh, number of jewelry from his collection and decided uh, to transmit them to uh, his uh, heir so that they could rule uh, uh, as kings uh, uh, after him. We have to think that jewels at that time were not only ornaments, they were not only uh, uh, pleasure for the eye, they were way to rule, they were uh, political tools per se, since they could be uh, um, used to, to, to get loans from banks, to, to, to raise money, uh, uh, to make wars, to... Uh, they could uh, be pledged. Pledged to, to, to pay soldiers, exactly, uh, in order to finance wars and to win them. So uh, uh, <laughs> if you were lucky, you would win the war, and so you would keep uh, 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 the diamonds. Exactly. <laughs> so um, Francis I had this idea in uh, 1530, when uh, he was actually married to Eleonora of Habsburg. It was quite a huge event as, at this time. You have to imagine that there was a, at last peace between the, the House of France, uh, the House of uh, the Savoie, uh, Valois, and the, the House of uh, the Habsburgs. Uh, Eleonora of, uh, um, of Habsburg was the uh, 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 daughter of uh, 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 Philip I of Spain. She was the sister of Charles V. And she was the widow, and this is quite interesting, of the King Manuel of Portugal, who, was, who just died, but who owned uh, uh, before that three of the largest rough diamonds that were known in Europe at that time, 190 and 60 carats, imagine. And uh, no spoilers once again, but those three diamonds so soon will be uh, French, as we're going to see. So there was this very important wedding. And uh, so he created this institution so, so that do, those uh, pieces of jewelry could be uh, worn by his uh, new wife, but also uh, transmit to his uh, heirs. So what was actually uh, those uh, pieces? Well, if we want to understand the importance of this collection, we have actually to go back a few years uh, before. In, uh, during his first wedding, actually, uh, this was his second wedding, Francis I in 1514 was married to the daughter of the Duchess Anne of Brittany, Claude de France, Claude of France. And uh, she had quite a, a, a very important uh, jewelry collection. And we know this for sure because we have inventories, quite precise ones, but we have also pictures from that time. And if we zoom into this portrait of uh, Anne of Brittany, we can see a beautiful necklace she's wearing. This necklace in France, we call it a carcan, which is kind of a bad word to, to describe jewelry. It was actually used for, for prisoners or for, for condemned people. It's a little bit of a straight jacket. Maybe we can, have a we can zoom uh, in this picture. And uh, uh, you can see it's quite, it's quite precise, actually. You can really uh, uh, identify four pearls every time. There was actually 15, 14 pearls on that necklace and 11 diamonds. And what is uh, fascinating with this necklace, if you look at it, is that diamonds look black. They look very, very dark. 
actually you have to imagine that diamonds at that time were not looking at all like today they were the, the cuts were not the same the stones themselves were not the same you wouldn't look at them for their brightness or their uh, whiteness you would look at them for their uh, hardness uh, mostly and their weight so uh, it was already quite an interesting uh, lapidary collection uh, uh, diamantaire we say in france because there was very various cuts there was uh, uh, diamonds which were cut as points as hearts it was already quite original uh, for that time and quite uh, an amazing uh, collection but there were not only diamonds and pearls in this rich collection they were also, also colored stones so these this original collection of stones and jewels selected by francis i amongst this collection were three or two very large spinels a spinel is actually a red stone it's beautiful and it was very symbolic for many reasons the color red since the beginning of, of emperors and, and kings the color red is a very symbolically important color and these spinels were part of the collection of Brittany of Marguerite de Foix uh, Anne of Brittany and Claude and they were very also symbolic of the fact that this is how France uh, Brittany you saw those those regions that Leonard showed you in the map became part of France so let's look at our very first one of our first gems that he selected it's the gem you see in the middle of the engraving on the right it's the Côte de Bretagne and it's actually a spinel of 214 carats he selected very specifically this this gem and throughout history this gem will be pledged it will be taken back it will come and go it's an extremely important stone in fact this stone alone could have probably paid for an entire city yeah. at the time so this is why these crown jewels are so critical because uh, they're, they're the history of France the history of kings and queens and on the bottom this was also one of the original uh, it's also a spinel and it actually is called the it was the bean of Naples but it was also called the Roman A because it was actually um, it was set on, a, on an A of course and of Brittany and so these two stones were one of the some of the original eight stones selected by Francis the first and above that you have a very large spinel of 247 carats which was actually added to the collection later by Francis the second and in the middle you have what is a rendering by Baps this brilliant man he read in the uh, inventory of, of uh, Mary Stuart, Marie Stuart, who was the tragic, she would have a tragic end, but she was a queen in France for what, a minute. And uh, this was in her inventory, and they, 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 they saw that it was set with an A, just like you see. And it was called a coutoir. This is probably where, partly where the name coute comes from. In, in the Renaissance, a coutoir was a, sort of a, a pendant. And Francis started to get interested in diamonds. There were three diamonds already. And he purchased a very important diamond called the Great Table, 41 carats. It was worth 212 kilos of gold. And he also purchased this cross that you see on the left with nine different diamonds, table cuts, which were very common in the Renaissance. You simply hack off the top, I'm simplifying, and those beautiful spearheads at the bottom with facets. He loved these pieces. The piece on the left was his personal piece. And as you'll see through our talk, sometimes kings would decide to put them in the official pieces and then they would come back depending on what the circumstances were. So they weren't all that inalienable. But this is a way for you to understand the importance of these original stones in the collection. And also the setting of this jewel would change uh, for almost which every uh, exactly. reign. So actually the spinels that we spoke about earlier, we'll come back to, uh, they're actually, people would confuse them with rubies, but they knew they were from a different uh, place. They were called Bala rubies. They were from the north of Afghanistan, present day Afghanistan and Tajikistan. And uh, they're, they're, this is one of the reasons why we have this name. Now we wanted to show you with, as time progresses, these gems are reset for each queen. Here we have two queens, probably not as famous as Catherine de Medicis, uh, the one uh, she'll, she, who, was, who was before them. But you have uh, Elizabeth of Austria on the right in this painting by Clouet. Now look at what she's wearing. She has Touré in her head. Those are all precious gems, pearls uh, through her hair. She has this beautiful, on her bodice, this beautiful row of, of precious gems and this coutoir that goes down. And it actually goes all the way down to her feet. And what she is wearing on her neck is the carcan, this, this necklace, which was redone, reset progressively 1530, 1547. And we know by the archives, a certain Dujardin reset it in 1570 when she became queen. And it's also interesting for us to know that <clears throat> on the left, if you look at her, her successor, who was also queen of France, Louise of Lorraine, Henry III's queen, 
Um, if you look at this pencil drawing, these were a specific of the Renaissance in France, you can see she's wearing a specific jewel on her chest, and you'll see that there's four pearls and actual diamonds. And so there's a hypothesis that actually this is the same carcan, and you can see on the right it was modified by the painters, perhaps to make it more colorful yeah. or more, um, let's say, let's, th there's colored stones. But to show you that it's very complex to understand jewelry, we have paintings and drawings, but it helps us, it gives us clues. So this carcan was changed on several occasions, and this is just two examples. Exactly. We, we know for sure François Cloué was the son of Jean Cloué, who was the official court painter. So he had access to the jewels, but he was only the author of the drawings, not of the paintings. The paintings were done by his workshop, by his partners, by his colleagues. And so it's also interesting also to understand like uh, painting workshop practices at that time. So you see there was already some kind of interpretation between one drawing and painting. So you, you sh always should uh, look at paintings. If you're looking for jewelry, you always have to be a, a little bit careful when you look at, uh, at paintings. What is also interesting uh, is that, uh, uh, so you, you, you told about the grand table by uh, the great table by uh, uh, Francis the first, there was some kind of a trauma, I think, because he, he, he lost in 1515 one of his favorite diamonds, which was the Mirror of France, uh, Le Miroir de France. And so he will uh, uh, try uh, every now and then to buy new, new stones, and the great table would be the largest cut diamond uh, known in Europe at that time, known in, in Christendom, uh, as we say. But soon uh, a very new uh, kind of stone will, will, will emerge. Uh, uh, it's a diamond, the Sancy diamond, and this diamond, you have to believe that for uh, almost two centuries, it will be known as the most beautiful diamond in the world. It was the nicest cut, the nicest quality, the nicest uh, uh, color also. And this diamond, we, 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 we know it for sure, uh, belonged to, well, there's kind of a rumors about it, its actual origins, but it was probably owned by the King of Portugal at some point. Uh, we know it for sure, but under a rough uh, uh, form. And it was cut and uh, sold to this man uh, called uh, Nicolas Arlet de Sancy, the Lord of Sancy. And this guy is quite an interesting character. This, this man was, um, used to be a, a lawyer uh, uh, in, in south of France. He was a, a Protestant and he, he was very patriotic and he, he wanted to defend um, uh, King uh, uh, Henry III against the Catholic League at that time. There were uh, religious wars in France at that time. And so he sold, uh, to, well, he, he, he got loan from the bank for, for two uh, of his, uh, um, he pledged his two most beautiful diamonds, the Grand Sancy, the, the great Sancy that you see here, and the beautiful Sancy, we don't say the small Sancy, it's a beautiful Sancy, which is a bit smaller, but with a wonderful cut, uh, in order to, 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 to bring soldiers from Switzerland at that time to defend uh, uh, the, the, the court. And those two diamonds are quite fascinating because you can see they're wholly faceted and it's new kinds of facets. Now it's triangles. You can see we are looking for uh, uh, more brightness. We're looking for sparkling. We're, you know, we are looking at uh, diamonds quite differently. But uh, when he proposed to, 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 to sell this diamond to uh, uh, um, Henry IV, uh, it was a bit too expensive. And actually uh, Henry IV uh, refused to buy it. And it was uh, quite uh, also a drama <laughs> in the household because uh, Mar Maria de Medici, the queen Marie de Medicis, wanted the, the, the diamond for herself. Uh, so she got a, a smaller gift, the other Sancy, that was uh, given to her and she would wear it uh, on her, on her uh, um, uh, crown. crown. But in 1604, this diamond was sold to James I of England, the King Jim James I, um, who decided the, the, the following year to make his own institution of the royal crown jewels. But long story short, uh, there were a lot of political uh, uh, struggle and, uh, and trouble in, in uh, England at that time. There would be the revolution, of course, and Cromwell. And most of the, the diamonds would soon arrive in, in the French coast with the exile of uh, uh, the king and uh, uh, Henriette Marie de France. And uh, everybody at that time in Europe was looking for diamonds and especially French kings and, uh, and cardinals. And, um, it's at that time really that uh, we're going to see new characters, a new uh, appreciation, let's say, for, for diamonds at that time, which would uh, become really the stone everybody wants, the most symbolic, the most prestigious uh, stone of them all. So in 1657, uh, uh, finally, uh, a, new, a new owner for the, the Sancy uh, 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 rises. The Sancy comes back in France 
Under the, the hand of uh, Mazarin Cardinal. Yes, so this is actually the beginning of the collections of our king, of Louis XIV, who was crazy about diamonds. But to start it off, if we go to the next slide, we can see Cardinal Mazarin, who was the advisor, chief advisor, and the and let's say the prime minister, the minister of Louis the Thirteenth and of Louis the young Louis the Fourteenth. He became king when he was uh, quite a young boy, and Mazarin was a man of the cloth, as you see. He was a cardinal, extremely wealthy. His fortune was inestimable. It was said it was worth twenty-two tons of gold, and Mazarin had purchased. He was not only a man of of war and of of uh, uh, political. He considered himself a man of peace as well, and he made. Uh, huge pur purchases of works of art, of stones. He was said to love uh, his stones and he would watch the reflections. He would watch them reflect and he would count them. And he actually purchased these stones because Henriette Marie of, of England had to come to France. And she, she of course, as you know, the, the English Revolution didn't end well uh, for Charles I. And she ended up having to sell the stones, so she sold them to Mazarin. And he purchased these 12 important stones. These stones will be the foundations of Louis XIV's, the young Louis XIV's collection. And uh, he left them to Louis XIV in his last will and testament. The conditions were very clear. The stones had to remain together. He could not uh, do anything with the stones. And they had to be called the Mazarins. So this is what the conditions were when Louis XIV inherited these stones as a young man in 1661. Now you see on the left, we have a rendering by Mohel. He's the, one of the great uh, historians of the jewels of the crown after Bapst, and we have his, his work, it's right behind us. And you see the variety. First of all, the Sancy on the top left. So the Sancy comes back to France. This beautiful double rose cut diamond of 50, over 55 carats. Another very famous Mazarin diamond is the third on the, on the top. The Mirror of Portugal. This was a, a very mythical diamond for many years, 26 carats. Um, don't forget, this is the early days of diamonds. We're not yet to the big giants, which we'll get to soon. And you also have a variety of different, you have the great, the Grand Mazarin, which is the number seven, which was 21 carats. So these, and look at the, you have these, these, um, these briolet cut diamonds uh, in the middle. You have table cut diamonds and you have these sort of uh, heart-shaped rose cuts on the bottom right. So there's a, a great variety of cuts. We're not yet in our brilliant cut. We'll get to that later. But you can see that um, lapidaries and, and diamantiers, they were experimenting with these different cuts. Now, Louis XIV's passion for diamonds really took off, probably influenced by his mother, Anne of Austria, who left him a great collection of pearls. This, which he received as a young man. And after the death of his mother, he went on a buying frenzy, didn't he? Buy, a literal frenzy of, of collecting as many stones as he could. Exactly, we say in France, uh, Louis XIV had a fièvre acheteuse, he had a fever, he wanted more and more diamonds. And really, uh, now we, we're talking about thousands of diamonds. The numbers are quite uh, exploding. In 1665, he bought a very beautiful diamond called the Diamant de Guise, a diamond which belonged to the de Guise family, the de Guise uh, house at that time. And in 1673, he bought what would be uh, called in 19th century the Hortensia diamond, but which was a, a pink, a beautiful pink diamond uh, with a very, very interesting cut also. Those diamonds at that time were all coming from India. India was not the only place in the world where you would find diamonds. There was also Borneo, for example, but Borneo was dedicated to a much more local market. Uh, the dime, all the diamonds you would find in Europe, in Europe were coming from India. They were actually coming from the the, the very east of India, maybe you, we can zoom on the sure. map to, to see the, the actual place. It's a, a place called Golconda. It was a, a very, very um, important uh, 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 secondary deposit for, for diamonds and, and mines uh, which were uh, associated with rivers. And there, uh, uh, um, French merchants uh, would go uh, to uh, uh, buy diamonds and, and, and they would uh, export them to, to France. We know this thanks to uh, Jean-Baptiste Tavernier. We talked about it uh, in, in the introduction. Jean-Baptiste Tavernier went six times in India, uh, uh, buying more and more diamonds for, for the king. And in his last trip, uh, uh, he, he bought one of the most important diamonds that was known at that time. You talked about it earlier on. You can see it here uh, on this picture of our replicas. It's at that, at, at that state, it's still the great Tavernier blue, but it will soon become the Louis XIV blue. The Grand Bleu de Louis XIV. You can see in the center 
revolutionary cut, a wonderful blue, a, 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 a gold yellow star on, on the back. Uh, this was the subject of our last conference with Professor Francois yeah. Farge and Gislain. Maybe you, you've followed it. If you, if you missed it, don't, don't forget to, to catch it on, on our YouTube channel. But this was only one of the blue stones you would find in the collection of Louis XIV at that time. There was also a great sapphire, quite an interesting stone if you look at it. It looks like a rough stone. It looks like it was not cut, but it was actually cut. But it was cut in a rhomboid form in order to keep the largest size, the largest uh, uh, weight also, the most important color. Because at that time there were, um, uh, there were ideas that would associate uh, these stones to, uh, uh, curating, to curing. Sorry. Uh, you, you would so they, they, would, they would think that uh, the bubonic plague could be cured thanks to a, a stone like this. So you would, on, you would not only look at it uh, for a, a, a from a jewelry perspective, let's say, it was also kind of a, a useful uh, stone to keep. And this is why it, it had never been recut. And this is why also it's still now today in the uh, Natural History Museum in Paris. It's because we, we, we looked at it in a, in, a, in a different way than the uh, other uh, diamonds uh, from that time. So we have to imagine that now Louis XIV bought uh, uh, thousands and thousands of diamonds. Is of course has the, the largest collection in Europe from that time, and still, believe it or not, it's still not the peak of uh, 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 the collection from from France. Still not the the, the maximum, the uh, uh, top for the golden age of the diamonds. Actually, this would be the case for the 18th century with the uh, arrival of a new stone. So this is a very mythical stone. It has so many stories attached to it. The Régent. The Régent was a diamond of 426 carats when it was rough. It was, it was actually bought by a governor from England who was working in India. Uh, he was the governor in Madras in the fort of St. George. And he actually wanted to purchase this stone because his idea was, if I have it cut the right way and I find the right king or queen, it'll be worth much more. Yeah. So he, he actually has the stone cut in London. In those days, London was a, quite an important center for stone cutting. They were sort of rivals with Antwerp and Amsterdam. And the high pricing of their, their work is what actually ended up doing them in. But a certain cope, uh, he took two years, 1703 to 1705, to cut this diamond in a brilliant cut. So here we are in a brilliant cut, which means 58 facets, including the cullet on the bottom, the different uh, uh, triangular shaped facets, which actually bring the fire and the light of the diamond out. There's a sort of tar, uh, feathers and blood, uh, as our colleague Adid always says, arguing about where the, 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 the brilliant cut started. There's a, a great suspicion that that diamond that you saw, the French blue, that was one of the really the, the first of the brilliant cuts with, with so many facets. There's this whole, um, let's say, iconot, this whole myth about a Peruzzi, that that's a story for, from Venice. So this diamond, he, he, he decided to try to find a buyer for this diamond. He tried Louis XIV. Yeah. Louis XIV said no. He was having trouble with the, at the end of his reign, paying for wars, the war of Spanish succession, etc. And finally, he finds somebody in the new uh, the regent, because when Louis XV became king, he was just a little boy. He was 10. Okay. And so the regent was uh, Philippe d'Orléans, who was a great lover of stones. There's myths about his stones. And uh, the regent, he convinces the regent council in 1717 to purchase the stone for two million French livres, which was a fortune. It sounds like a fortune, and it was. <laughs> And he convinces him to purchase the stone, and it becomes very quickly the most mythical stone. There was a Sassimo, who was one of the commentators of the time, who gave himself credit. He said, I'm so happy that I convinced the regent yeah. to purchase this diamond. He says it's the si size of a plum, of a Ren Claude plum, which is a, a quite a big, uh, uh, well, for a stone, it's quite big. So this regent becomes, in the, mytholo the mythology, it's 140.64 carats. It becomes the symbol of the French monarchy, and it becomes uh, so important that it, it becomes, it's used by the French monarchs from this moment on, and we'll see in the regalia, in crowns, etc. And the region is still actually to this day considered one of the most beautiful diamonds uh, yeah. that, through its color, its transparency, etc. Exactly, and for that time it was like the equivalent of the Cullinan today. It was exactly. really like a wonder, it was really one of a kind. And this is why, of course, when Louis XV decided to have a new crown made for his coronation, 
uh, the regent would be uh, set to it. So yes, for, for the young king, he was 12 for his, his, uh, his coronation. In France, uh, in the French coronations, there were always, uh, there were three crowns, really. The one crown of Charlemagne, which was fully symbolic. And then there was a crown uh, made of gold and uh, enameled gold. And then there was a crown in silver gilt, which was the personal crown. And this is the version in silver gilt made for the little 12-year-old Louis XV. And this crown, it became, it was made by a certain Augustin Duflou. He was a great, uh, let's say, he was one of the uh, silver and goldsmiths, jewelers of the king in the galleries in the Louvre. And a father and son team, the Rondes, they are the ones who designed it and they actually delivered it to the king in 1722. And what's important is, as, as Leonard is showing you, the, the Régent was set on the front. In that front fleur de lis, you can see the Régent becomes really the symbol. Louis the uh, Louis the Fifteenth had worn it when he visited one of the ambassador of Turkey, I think, came, and it becomes the stone. But this crown is extremely spectacular. If you look, this is the back of the crown, and it has actually 280 different uh, stones, diamonds, and it has uh, topaz, uh, sorry, yellow sapphires, uh, blue sapphires, uh, rubies. It was such a sumptuous crown, uh, the way that the stones are set in different angles. And on the top, in that fleur de lis on the top of the crown, we have our sensi. So you see our diamonds, our Mazarin diamonds, they come back and back. And also, all of the fleur de lis around the crown, on the summit of each of the fleur de lis is, uh, is a Mazarin diamond, one of those Mazarins that they're mostly more table cut. So this crown becomes an important symbol of the monarchy the polychrome nature. These are actually paste, these are fake stones. It was, it, after the coronation, it was sent to the Saint-Denis treasury, and there were fake stones added. Why? Because the real stones were taken and used for other pieces of regalia and jewelry. And this crown survived uh, history. It was very unusual. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later when we get into the trials and tribulations. And it's now in the Louvre. It ended up in, in the Louvre. Exactly, and already at that time, one rule was broken is that the Mazarin stones were recut in order to fit in, in, into this uh, new setting. And uh, also we could, we could uh, uh, see it as a crime or you could, we could critic, cr uh, make some critics. But uh, even if Louis XV didn't buy any new diamonds, he really wanted to have a new fashion around it. He wanted to reset, to make a new aesthetic around it. And one of his most bold gesture was to ask to recut the Côte de Bretagne. You remember this spinel we saw in the beginning of the conference, these big red stones that was probably coming from Pakistan, from the uh, uh, Middle East. This stone was cut in the shape of a dragon in order to be set on a golden fleece uh, uh, order, a military order, a masculine uh, uh, of, piece of jewelry next to the blue uh, diamond of Louis XIV. So you saw uh, uh, on, our next, on our last conference uh, uh, the details for the, uh, the creation of this piece. But what I, what I find quite interesting if, in terms of style, if you look at this dragon, it doesn't look uh, uh, antique at all. It looks quite almost Chinese. It's, it's like it's not a classical diamond. It's not a neoclassical diamond. It's very rocaille. It's quite asymmetrical. If you compare it to the diamonds and uh, next to him, it's quite a naturalistic figure, but also quite uh, uh, round, very, very asymmetric, very uh, auricular, as we say, which is typical for the rocaille taste, for this very 18th century Louis XV style, which makes it very unique also in the history of jewelry. And given this craft, given this style, given the, this new way uh, of, of looking at stones, um, a lot of people think this is quite uh, an important piece for the uh, birth of high jewelry. Now uh, uh, you, can, you, you can look uh, at a piece from every angle, it's very tridimensional, it's totally a, a, a revolution by its own in the art of uh, lapidary, but also for, for jewelry making. It was reduced, by the way, to 107 carats. Half. We went from our 212 yeah. to 107. It was a great sacrifice, but the, you have to admit, it's a beautiful result. Exactly. But uh, this was not the only danger that could uh, threat uh, the, the royal crown jewels at that time. There would uh, soon be a new threat uh, uh, towards them. So we're, get, we're entering into our uh, more sort of uh, action-packed part, the life and misfortunes of the collection. So we'll, we'll fast forward now. We know the French Revolution began in 1789, the terror, et cetera, the, the royal family that was put in, uh, that was basically put under house arrest and eventually executed. And 
just in this period, you have to understand there was uh, the royal collections were all kept in a place which is still exists on the Place de la Concorde, which is the Hotel yeah. de la Marine. It's on. Uh, it's it's right on the corner of the Rue Saint Florentin. And the actual depository of the king's uh, royal furnishings and objects and jewels were kept there since 1775. Now, this was a very important role. The person who was in charge at that time was a man named Thierry de Ville And he kept track of all of the things that were in this place. Now, there were tapestries, there were furnishings, there were um, bronzes, there were things that weren't being used at that time in the royal palaces. So if you will, it was a depository. And on the first floor, were our, our, our crown jewels, all of the gems that we talked about, thousands of gems. And of course, when the events in the Tuileries Garden, when the family was finally, uh, the, the revolution really began in August of 1792, people were very distracted with what was going on uh, not far. If, if you're familiar with Paris, the Tuileries is just across the way. And there was, uh, there was also something very, not very smart that was done. 1791, they did an extremely public and extremely uh, uh, deta detailed yeah. inventory of all of the, the jewels that were in this place. So this, of course, of course, people noticed. And also, uh, you have to know also that in, on Mondays, uh, for, uh, starting in 1791, the public could go visit uh, the crown jewels on the first floor of this building. So with all of this uh, soup of different things going on, the revolution, yeah. the, the people's attention spans were elsewhere, uh, we had a very huge event that took place. Yeah, you could think that these visits, these openings were a good idea, which was the case, but actually uh, uh, you have to think that the situation, the political si situation in 1792 was very troubled in France. It was kind of a mess, uh, uh, to say it not properly. There was like a lot of things going on, very violent situation also. And in the night of the 16th of September in 1792, some guards were uh, having their uh, uh, normal round in the uh, Place de la Révolution, the actual Place de la Concorde, and they heard some, some laughs, they heard some screams, they, they, uh, they heard some people singing, and they, they saw people actually falling from the balcony of the Garde Meuble during that night. They couldn't believe their eyes because those people were drunk. And when they took, uh, when they took them to actually on, and they put them back on their on their feet, they saw they had diamonds in their pockets, and something was not matching, like a drunk man on, on this <laughs> square with diamonds in his pocket. So they rushed in the building, they opened the door for the the garden map for the place where all the royal crown jewels were uh, put, and actually all the uh, jewels were gone. They were only like broken glass on the floor, rest of food. Actually, p people had parties there, and for six nights in a row, they, they, ha they had been stealing uh, those precious jewels. So there was not only one heist, there was many, many heists. And actually, uh, still today, we don't know for sure who was the actual responsible for su such a crime. There were actually many of them, but it was a huge scandal at the time, political scandal, because everybody was accusing every, everybody, the Girondins, the counter-revolutionary, Danton himself, who was sought for um, uh, financing some of the wars uh, uh, and the victory of Valmy at that time. So it was quite a, a huge thing, but uh, all the force of police were put on the case, and pretty soon uh, some, arrestation, uh, uh, some arrests were, were made. And uh, at that time, of course, you had the death penalty in France. And in order to make this uh, event even more political, we decided to move the guillotine from the Place des Grèves, from the town hall of Paris, to the very Place de la Concorde, Place de la Révolution, in order to execute the uh, author of the crimes. And some of them decided to, to negotiate their uh, grace, uh, this, their grace uh, um, we, uh, while, saying, uh, to, while telling to the police where the, stool, uh, the jewels were. And this is how most, let's say, the, the largest part of the jewels were found back, like the regent which, which was found uh, uh, under the roof of, of, of a house in, 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 the, in the suburbs. Uh, but some stones were still missing. Uh, the blue diamond of Louis XIV was, had disappeared. Uh, the Grand Sancy had disappeared also. The Côte de Bretagne was found uh, later on in, in Holland. It was probably going to be recut uh, in order to be sold, probably in England. But little by little, the, the, the collection was, was uh, 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 bring back, and the regent uh, would be uh, immediately used by, um, by uh, the, the re revolutionary government 
Um, in order uh, to finance, once again, the re revolutionary wars in Italy, the, the campaign in Italy. And during those campaigns, we had a, a, a quite a famous general, very victorious one, which, which was called uh, Bonaparte at that time. He was very successful. He was also very superstitious. And he thought that the very reason why he won, he won those campaigns was thanks to this stone, who uh, actually made it possible. And so when he was uh, made first uh, consul, maybe we can see uh, his portrait or, or the sword, he decided to set the regent, uh, he, he decided to set the stones, not on a piece of jewelry, but on the sword itself, on his first consul uh, sword, next to other stones from the uh, Mazarin collection. And this was quite a, a, a bold move. And what is fascinating, if you look at portraits from that time, like the one we have from uh, Antoine Jean Gros, Antoine Jean Gros is not such a famous painter, but he was a, a, a very important battle painter uh, at that time, the Battle of Elo in the Louvre, a very, very large uh, format. He painted his, his portrait as a first consul, and you can see he really um, put the light on this uh, sword. And it's quite fascinating because you can see that now, from now on, on the paintings, Diamonds are uh, uh, pictured in a totally new way. They're very bright, they're very, uh, they're very light, they're very clear, they have a lot of sparkling also. And uh, I think it's one of the very first case uh, uh, diamonds were represented this way uh, in uh, Western art. So this piece of jewelry was made by a, a man named uh, Marie-Étienne mm. Nito. Nito would become one of the favorite jewelers of Napoleon, one of the favorite jewelers also of Josephine, uh, uh, his first wife, who was actually uh, the main client for every maison in Paris at that time. She was like a missine or a patron for the whole hearts of, uh, of jewelry in Paris at that time. And lots of uh, um, uh, ordering, lots of special commands were made uh, for her, uh, sets, etc. Uh, Napoleon was very in love with her, but sadly he had to, to, to divorce, he had to separate because uh, he couldn't have a child from her. So he decided to, to, mar to marry uh, um, in a second wedding. Uh, the Empress uh, Marie-Louise. So Napoleon, of course, crudely, it was said, he said, I married, I married a womb, but he married into the Habsburgs, and something we wouldn't say today, and we, he shouldn't have said it, but it was something that he was always quoted as saying, Marie-Louise was a beautiful woman. She was the great, uh, the, the, the grandniece of Marie Antoinette, the tragic queen of France, and he, to impress her, he decided to send her before their wedding a huge wedding basket. A wedding basket is when you, you, the bride receives gifts. And he sent her four or five complete sets. We say parure. And in the empire, you see in her, in her actual um, portrait, the uh, parure is, is actually a comb. There's a diadem. There's a necklace. There's matching bracelets. And there's a belt with that high empire waist. And one of the, those sets that he sent her was diamonds. And there were so many diamonds. The crown jewels were in this in this diadem, and there was the the fleur de pêche. There was one of the Mazarins, etc. And it was one of her favorite and most costly and one of the most spectacular sets of the time. He also gave her opals, an opal set. He gave her a pearl set, and he gave her an emerald set. The emerald set. Some of these, uh, just a, a technicality, some of these sets were in her private collection. It was always specified, these are private, these are the crown jewels. And he gave her a set of emeralds and diamonds. And it's also by uh, Nitu. Nitu and his son, they became the, uh, probably with Marguerite, uh, the, the most, uh, they were really the, the purveyors of, of Napoleon and, and Josephine and then Marie Louise. And they created a set, there was a diadem, there was a comb, etc. And this set she kept in her private collection. This beautiful necklace has uh, something like 32 emeralds and uh, diamonds. And you can see they're sort of briolet cut with all these facets on the sides, pear shaped. And it's in the real empire style. You can see those palmettes, etc. And in those days, jewelry was, was silver uh, because to make the diamonds come out. And it was backed by gold uh, just to prevent, obviously, from when the, to have the oxidation, which would show on your skin. And these are open back stones. So this is an extremely exquisite piece. And this entire set, when Marie Louise fled, as you, you, the end of the empire came in 1814, she fled and she took her private jewels with her. She was required to give back those that belonged to the crown, but she kept her private jewels. And her ancestors, well, her family, her aunt in, in Austria, uh, kept it. And when she died in 1847, our Marie Louise, these jewels stayed in the Habsburgs. And by descent, they ended up in a prince, one of the Habsburg princes who had his land in a part of which is now Poland. 
And his family kept these jewels. They had a very difficult uh, time because, uh, first of all, when the Germans came in 1939, he refused to capitulate. He was tortured. And then uh, worse, uh, bad things got even worse when the Soviets came. And this family ended up emigrating to uh, Sweden. His wife was a Swedish, a Swedish princess. And the ancestors, uh, when he died, his children sold this parure, this set, Part of it to this to the Maison von Cleef and Arpels in the 50s, uh, the diadem, and which uh, of which the emeralds were sold, and the diadem was saved, and you can see it now in the Smithsonian. And um, this necklace and earrings were sold into a private collection, and they reappeared quite recently, and the Louvre was able to acquire them from a private collection. So it's a it's a real let's say. Uh, it's a, it's a testament to the beautiful, the, the, the beauty and the, the expense on these jewels. And now my Louise, of course, she also, uh, she loved diamonds. Was I talking about the diamond? The, the, uh, the diamonds, here we are. Sorry, I jumped the gun. Here's the diamond pario, of course, which I talked about earlier. And actually, when she gave birth to her heir, the king of Rome, uh, she was, he was enthralled, Napoleon was enthralled. And he, um, he, of course, gave her this beautiful diamond necklace, which complemented her parure that we spoke about. And in fact, in that painting, uh, she's actually wearing this necklace. And so the necklace has old cut diamonds in the center, and it has these, these uh, pear shaped and these briolette cut diamonds around the edges. It's over 260 carats. And she wore this necklace, and when she fled France, in, uh, in, to, uh, sorry, in, in uh, 1814. And after her death, like the emeralds, it became a property of her family. And her sister-in-law kept it. She removed a couple of the diamonds and shortened it slightly. But other than that, it has not been modified. And this beautiful necklace was actually, again, uh, it made its way to the United States in the 1940s. It was, uh, first of all, France, uh, sorry, a French collector. And it made its way to the United States into the hands of Harry Winston. Harry Winston, of course, the great diamond merchant in the U.S., he ended up selling it to Marjorie Merriweather Post, this great, uh, this great heiress of the Post fortune, and who loved Marie Antoinette, by the way, and Marie Louise, and she donated it to the Smithsonian. So you see how the, these jewels that survived, this is a personal jewel, but it was part of the, of the imperial, the empire period, and we're very lucky that it survived. And by the way, these diamonds were analyzed by our friends at the, at the Smithsonian and at the Museum uh, of the of École des Mines, and they found that many of these diamonds are type 2A, very high quality. So even they didn't have the same mechanisms that we have today, they were able to really uh, pick the best stones. So we only have a few minutes left, so we, we are going to need to go through time, and we're going to come back to Louis XV uh, later on. Um, just uh, keep in mind that in uh, 1814, when uh, um, Louis, the, Louis XVIII came to, to power, there were more than 65,000 of stones and pearls in the Royal Crown Jewels collection in France. So just imagine uh, uh, what, what the reality of this collection was. Um, Charles, Charles X was uh, quite interesting because once again in this, not, not so Napoleonic tradition, but more uh, 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 Carolingian uh, tradition, he decided once again to have a, a, a royal uh, a sword, and he had decided that we can, we can see some details on, uh, of the sword to, to set those uh, diamonds in a beautiful design by uh, the Babst family. You, you remember the Babst? We are talking about this uh, jeweler slash historian, Germain Babst. He was the heir of this uh, uh, wonderful jewelry dynasty. And this stolen had quite a sad story because it was then modified by Napoleon III during the Second Empire. There was, uh, we can see some bees on, on the sword. You can see the, the, the chiffre of Napoleon III. This was a, a modification which was uh, made by him. But uh, most of all, this, uh, sto uh, this sword was stolen in 1976 in the Louvre, and it's still lost today. Nobody knows where uh, it is, and I hope uh, the diamonds won't be recut, and I hope someday uh, this sword will come back to the, the museum. It, 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 its place is in a museum with Sega Legends. And uh, among those same uh, uh, creations, which was then uh, in, uh, which was made in the, during the reign of uh, Charles the, uh, the Tenth, was this beautiful crown. A beautiful crown uh, made by Babst once again. We only uh, know some replicas, and uh, it had, of course, uh, uh, the, the regent uh, on it, and it only had uh, diamonds and sapphires. And this is quite interesting because for, for a long time, sapphires were associated with femininity because it was the blue of the Virgin Mary, but also the blue of the kings of France, the real uh, color for, for kings in France. So it was for for him, quite a, a masculine, quite a, a, a viril uh, piece of jewel, and quite a fantastic one, too. 
So we're, oh, this is the second empire. Exactly, the, the story uh, doesn't end. We have uh, uh, Eugénie. Eugénie was also kind of a reincarnation, let's say, of Marie Antoinette. She, she, Marie Antoinette was really her model. And she really brought back in, in the court of the, the Napoleon III this aesthetic of rocaille, the aesthetic of uh, uh, Louis XVI style. And she had this uh, wonderful piece of jewelry made by Le Monnier, Le Monnier which, which was picked as a royal crown uh, jeweler uh, during the Exposition Universelle in London at that time. And she had this wonderful uh, diadem made uh, only with diamonds and pearls. And you have to also to keep in mind that pearls, there were no culture pearls at that time, they were all fished, let's say, one by one in uh, uh, Caribbean or the Pers uh, Arabo-Persian Gulf. Um, at that time, so quite a fantastic uh, piece of jewelry once again, which you can see on many paintings made from uh, the Winterhalter portrait. So we're, we're headed now after the fall of the Second Empire. The 19th century in France is complicated, right? Revolution, uh, restoration, another restoration, another revolution, another empire. And we'll just skip forward to the Third Republic. And what happened after the fall of, of the Second Empire in 1870, there was an ambivalence or, uh, that began to stir in, in the, this, this republic uh, about these crown jewels. What, what do they represent and, uh, and what, why, why do we even have them? And nevertheless, they were displayed on two very important occasions. In 1878, at the Universal Exhibition of Paris, visited by 16 million people. This was really the age of exhibitions. This was pre-internet. These were in, uh, huge manifestations. And they were presented, and uh, the crowds came to see them. And in 1884, they, they did another exhibition in the Louvre actually, in, in one of the main rooms of the Louvre, the Salle des Etats. And these were presented in their complete form. And th these photos are extremely rare. You'll understand why in a minute. Because we see the complete set. This is the complete set of the ruby, the ruby set that was made originally uh, for Marie-Louise and, and then later um, uh, modified for, actually, the Duchesse d'Angoulême we'll talk about in a minute. And this man, Enou, who took these photos, um, he wrote a sort of not very historically accurate uh, picture of the diamonds in terms of his book. But his photos are extremely precious. Keep this one in mind as we go, as we go ahead into our next chapter, our final chapter, uh, which is, uh, well, our third chapter, which is going to start in a, in a minute. So in the destiny of the crown jewels, what, what ended up happening was the, um, the Republic had discussions actually since 1848, to be sure. To be sure. And uh, later in the, in the 1882, there was a man named uh, Benjamin Raspail. His father had been a huge opponent of the crown jewels and of Napoleon III and he himself. So he started within the Senate and the houses, uh, a move, he, he, he put a movement on the table that these gems should be decommissioned. That means they should be allowed to, we should get rid of them. And finally, they passed an actual, um, another, they, it was voted by what, 325 yep. votes to 85, something yep. like that. Quite a large one. Yes. And, uh, but then it, this was in 1882. It took them until 1886 to actually, uh, to actually start yeah. moving on it. And then they discussed for ad nauseum, what, where will the money go, the proceeds go from the sale. The decision was made to have the sale. And the law was finally published, at, uh, passed at the end of 1886 and published in 1887. Of course, it was highly political. Um, it was motivated by a fear that some new person would show up yeah. and wear these gems. So this led to our, our sort of very tragic chapter, which we want to talk about. They were, you have to imagine that this third republic was quite fragile and young. And even though there was no real threats from uh, the empire side, there was no, uh, there was no new uh, heir uh, on that side, uh, this republic saw that cutting the heads of Louis XVI was not enough. King came back afterwards. So now you had to cut them all. You have to cut the collection. You have to cut their power. And by uh, selling, actually, the whole collection, uh, during um, a very uh, uh, crazy event, well, there's no other words. Uh, for for nine uh, uh, during nine sessions, uh, the, the totality, the whole of the uh, Royal Crown Jewel collection was sold uh, um, during during a sale. And uh, you have to imagine that uh, there were so many diamonds. You, you, you had at that time more than seventy-seven thousand stones uh, sold at, at that sale. The price for diamond dropped uh, uh, worldwide uh, because of the amount of stone which was uh, on the market. It was also the time; it was kind of a bad context because uh, you would. It was also at that time that we found diamonds in South Africa, very same year. So this is why also at that time pearls were valued so much because they were kind of rare compared to diamonds. 
But uh, which, which was uh, a very sad day for jury historians and for the history of France was actually a, a, a wonderful day for many, many jewelers who came from all over the world to buy pieces uh, uh, during that sale. One of the main buyers was, of course, the Maison Tiffany eh, from New York, who, who, who bought the majority of the stones. Uh, for them, it was quite a, a, a genius marketing opportunity because like this, they could propose to the very rich industrial uh, heirs of the, um, uh, the US the status of the actual aristocracy from, uh, from Europe. But uh, there was not only Tiffany, there was also Boucheron, uh, the jeweler maison uh, from Paris. There was a, a Babst themselves, the family would try to buy stones in order to protect them, in order to keep this uh, inheritance, to keep this uh, a legacy uh, inside of the frontiers of France. And also uh, um, a Van Cleef, a certain Van Cleef in 1887 who, buy, who bought uh, a fleurette. Fleurette which would be important for the Van Cleef maison. But uh, luckily, uh, just like after the, the, the big heist in uh, 1792, some uh, stones were kept uh, by the government. Of course, the regent was not sold. It was put in the Louvre. It was the most important stone at that time, right, before the Calinan. And uh, also, we can talk about the uh, Ecole des Mines, the, the, now the Mineralogy Museum uh, uh, in, in Paris, who um, got many, many uh, amethysts uh, who used to belong to Marie-Louise, uh, emeralds also, topaz, just like the Natural History Museum in Paris who owned, among many other stones, like the big blue sapphire that we saw earlier on, the great opal of Louis XVIII, which was uh, actually won by uh, Charles X during his coronation. So, what happened with our crown jewels uh, after, the, after the sale? Some of these jewels reappeared in unusual places. We talked about these families. These, these, uh, Tiffany ended up selling a lot of these jewels to American heiresses. They wanted a little piece of the French monarchy and of royalty. And these are actually, this is actually the diadem and the bracelets from that parure that you saw in its complete form in that black and white photo. And these were actually uh, acquired by intermediaries. Actually, the bracelets were acquired by Tiffany and the diadem by another buyer, people sent buyers, and a certain Martin Bradley family purchased these two pieces. Uh, the Martin Bradleys were infamous because they, they created the most expensive ball in the history of New York mm -hmm. in 1897, which cost the equivalent of millions of dollars. It was a time of, of economic depression in the United States. Although Mrs. Bradley Martin felt that she was doing a service, she was creating jobs by having people order their gowns in New York, their jewels, etc. And she wore these jewels too. that, uh, she dressed as Marie Stewart. It was at the Waldorf Hotel. And it was one of the most, let's say, scandalous parties because of the difficult economic times. But it, it was really the Gilded Age in, in the United States when these very wealthy families, the Bradley Martins actually, their daughter became actually a countess. And she had to actually, she moved to England and her family emigrated after this infamous party. But what's important for us is that these, these actual pieces, the one on the top ended up in a private collection and it still is. And the bracelets actually made their way to the Louvre. Uh, in 1973 by the generosity of a donor. So we have, uh, we have the bracelets uh, and you can see them today in the Apollo Gallery of the Louvre. The Louvre has been trying to acquire pieces, actually. The original eight pieces were given from the commission, the scientific commission in 1887. And ever since the 50s, they've been acquiring pieces as much as they can. Now, another story um, of a gem, if we, if we go to the next slide. Th th this, this, this actual set was made as well as this diadem. Um, Louis XVIII, who was, became king after the empire fell, he actually had no queen. His queen was his, his niece, the only surviving child of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. And her name was Madame Royale, and she became the, Duchess, the Duchess of Angoulême because she married her first cousin, who was the Duke of Angoulême. And during that brief 15-year period of the Restoration, she, for two kings, she was the queen, sort of the queen and the, the woman of the family. And she wore the jewels, and Louis XVIII had them reset for her. And it was Bapst again, our, 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 our friends at Bapst that reset, also with Meunier. And this emerald diadem became uh, such a symbol of the restoration. Again, it's silver and with uh, gold, backed by gold. It has a, a very large 16, almost 16 karat emerald in the middle, which belonged to the crown jewels. The rest of this uh, set was actually part of the Duchesse d'Angoulême's private collection. So this piece was sold during the crown jewels sale and it survived. It was in a private collection um, of Hungarian uh, prints on the left. 
you see his wife. She's wearing uh, Mrs. Andresi, the Countess Andresi. And in the 1950s, it was purchased yet again, and it ended up in the collection of actually the Dukes of Durham. The Dukes of Durham, this is um, the actually Lady Lambton on the right, uh, taken by Cecil Beaton, another, she was a wealthy American lady who married into British aristocracy. And she would wear the diadem with fake emerald earrings. And she would have, she was a very eccentric lady. She had parties with lions and, and leopards roaming about. She loved uh, Mick Jagger. Uh, she, she actually was known to tell her children to make noise at tourist spots because she wanted the tourists to leave so she could have. She was in two very serious accidents, which she survived. Very unusual lady. And she wore this diadem until it was uh, put in on display in the Victoria and Albert Museum by her family. And it was finally sold in 2002, and the Louvre was able to acquire it. It's a beautiful piece. It's a, it's a real masterpiece of restoration jewelry, this sort of, um, uh, let's say, 18th century revival, beautiful emeralds, and we're lucky that it's back in the Louvre. And we have uh, this beautiful piece as well that was also um, purchased recently. Exactly, it's one of the very, very last wonders of the Royal Crown Jewels. Uh, uh, of course, we, w we would have liked to show you uh, many, many uh, more, like the, the Groseillier or uh, many other oh, that's spectacular. pieces. Yeah. But this one is quite a wonder for many reasons. Actually, there was a transformation to it. First, it was made by François Kramer, one of the favorite uh, Eugénie uh, jurors, um, as a belt ornament. But then it was transformed by Babst in order to be worn as a body ornament. And what is fascinating with this uh, piece of jewelry, maybe we can also uh, have a zoom, it's of course the numbers of uh, diamond it contains. Uh, uh, it's quite hard to, to, to count them, uh, thousands of th uh, and thousands of diamonds on it. Once again, uh, on a, a silver back with gold, uh, uh, fully, uh, uh, fully um, pierced. The light is really getting through uh, the piece from every angle, but it's also uh, entirely animated. It's like a pompon, it's like a, a piece of uh, passementerie we say in France. It's like a, almost a textile, very, very fluid, very, very large and bright also. And you have to imagine how, how much it must have uh, sparkled under the lights of a uh, chandelier, uh, during balls. It's, it's, it, it really is a wonder and it is in the Louvre uh, today. And this lady on the right, another uh, great American fortune, the Astors, uh, Caroline Lena Shermerhorn Astor. She was the Mrs. Astor. She wanted to be the Mrs. Astor. This piece was actually purchased by an intermediary, and then the Astors purchased it, and she wore it for a hundred. Well, she didn't wear it. For, her family kept it for a hundred years, and it stayed in their family until it was in a private American collection, and then it was actually sold by a person-to-person -person sale by Christie's directly to the Louvre. But who was this Mrs. Astor? She was actually, uh, when, her, um, when a member of her family died, her, her sister-in-law died, and she decided, I'm now going to be the Mrs. Astor. And uh, her nephew actually was quite offended, William Waldorf Astor, who actually uh, ended up giving the Sancy or selling the Sancy. William Waldorf Astor was really angry because he, he considered that his wife, not his aunt, should be the Mrs. Astor. And this conflict became so intense that William Waldorf Astor, he was living on 40, uh, 34th and 5th across next door to his aunt. He left for England and he had his home torn down and he built the Waldorf Hotel. He did it intentionally. It made lots of noise. The, 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 that part of New York was changing rapidly. And she decided, her son told her, well, you should leave too and go uptown to the 64th. So she did the same and built the Astoria Hotel. So be because of this feud, and now it's the site of the Empire State Building, you had the first Waldorf Astoria Hotel. And she ended up holding parties on her 64th Street house. And unfortunately, she, she had a head injury and her life became much less party oriented. But just again, these stories, these women dreamt of the crown jewels. She considered probably herself, it was royalty. Mm -hmm. It was the Gilded Age, we call that, of New York. And it's a very interesting story. And again, these crown jewels have so many stories. We could go on for hours about each one, couldn't we? Exactly, and you have really to, to, to believe that th this story, is, this history is not uh, finished at all. Uh, the story continues per se because, of course, the Louvre is buying uh, uh, more and more uh, uh, pieces. We are still uh, uh, finding uh, during some, uh, some events uh, new, uh, new pieces from the Royal Crown Jewels, like this uh, belt plate from, from Babst, which was uh, bought back by the Louvre in uh, 2019. Uh, so there is still a hope to see more and more jewels uh, inside of the Apollo Gallery uh, uh, of the Louvre. Also, we would like to, to, to share with you tonight a very uh, uh, um, 
special uh, piece is this uh, uh, many many photograph actually which was uh, taken during the very uh, sale of 1887 actually the very first photograph which was taken for the catalog were not good enough for the jewelers of that time who asked for uh, high res resolution uh, uh, pictures uh, uh, for the sale and of course we have only uh, very very few copies of such uh, uh, photographs in, in, in France today and they are the very last testimony for both uh, gem quality, uh, jewelry making, craftsmanship for all of those pieces. You can recognize here the Hortensia diamond, uh, the Degui, some of the uh, uh, Mazarin also. So it's, we are very, very lucky to own this piece. You can, we, can, we would like to share it with you tonight, but also for any visitor which would come to our library to study uh, 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 jewelry history uh, with us. So this is the end of our presentation. I believe we have a, a conference coming up uh, pretty soon. Yes, we have our next conference, which I'd like to tell you about. It will be in Hong Kong. And it's actually the first time we have a campus in Hong Kong. And what we're doing is it's on gold. And it's actually going to take place in duplex. So our, our colleague and friend, Mahilo Cassius de Ranton, who's a very talented gemologist, and a speaker in Hong Kong, whose yeah. name I can't see on the, it's not on my screen. Marie Lemaitre. Very, thank you, Marie Lemaitre. Is going to, um, they're going to do a one-off in, in Hong Kong. And uh, what is the date of this conference? Uh, I'm not sure, but you can already uh, uh, subscribe to it uh, on this uh, uh, QR code uh, on the screen. You can use your phone uh, uh, for it. So this uh, uh, will be the next conference, then we'll have one uh, uh, every month. We'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, to give you also a few information, a few book references for the subject of tonight, articles, uh, books. And uh, if you have any question, of course, it's the time we can uh, answer some of them. Uh, I hope we'll be able to answer because, of course, this uh, subject is still a huge mystery for uh, most of its parts uh, to us and to many uh, historians. Um, we're going to try to answer uh, uh, some of them. And uh, if we don't have time, you also have uh, the occasion to share with us your questions through uh, social networks like Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram or YouTube. YouTube, where you'll be soon able to see uh, this conference again. So uh, I'm, I'm reading Gislain. Uh, Gislain just sent me the questions today. Um, have any recent French royal jewels went on auction since that of the Bourbon Parma family in 2008? Well, we just talked about uh, uh, the, in 2019 this uh, uh, um, belt uh, 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 ornament, this belt element. Yes, the element from the belt. In, in rubies. There was also one of the small necklace, the small ruby necklace from that parure was, I believe it was 2019, it was, yeah. it was, on, it was on auction. And pieces do come up at auction. Uh, it's good to pay attention to what's going on. And one of the great sources for this information, if any of you follow uh, Vincent Mélan, who's a friend of l'école and a great author about the history of jewelry and royal jewels especially, he's very good at following this. And if you follow his Instagram, um, you can find out. And I tried, uh, when we prepared this lecture, I did find a few uh, pieces that appear every so often. We also had, um, in 2015, the groseillier, that beautiful um, current leaf um, yeah. uh, parure. Yeah. There was one brooch that appeared, and it was actually uh, yeah. purchased by a private collector. So there, are, there have been pieces since then, yes. Another question, uh, which I think quite, quite interesting, is uh, where did the fake materials come from that were used to replace the real stones? crystals like what was used in the chandelier of the, of the period. Actually, that's very true. Glass was used to replace stones uh, already at that time. And it's quite interesting because there was a kind of a tradition for fake diamonds already at that time, even in the royal collection, because in uh, 1887, during the big sale of the uh, official diamonds, there, were, there was also the personal collection of Napoleon III. Um, it was actually a fake diamond collection. It was the historical diamonds. He had replicas. And even the replicas were sold uh, uh, during this uh, uh, sad uh, event. Another question. Uh, has Madame Royale ever had a chance to get any of her mum's Marie Antoinette jewelry back? Actually, Madame Royale, at the time, she did inherit the jewelry. Actually, uh, Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI had sent uh, a jewels, and they had sent it to the Habsburgs, and there was a, a bank account. So when she escaped, 
uh, finally was let go because uh, her brother, who would have been the king, was killed, and so she was no longer a threat. So in 1795, she was allowed to leave, and this started these 20 years of exile. And yes, she did have her jewels, and her jewels, they were personal jewels of Maya Antoinette, and they do appear at auction every so often. Um, they're, they're direct lineage. She had no children, but she left her jewels to her niece and her nephew, uh, the Duchess of Parma, and those are the jewels that I believe you see appearing at auction every so often. The problem with these jewels is it's extremely difficult um, to, to make a direct link because there's inventories, yes, but scientifically. But they are, for example, the pearl that was sold uh, quite recently for, what was it, 34 million? Yeah. That came from um, Maya Antoinette to Madame Royale. So this tragic, uh, the orphan of the temple, we called her, um, she actually ended up, uh, yes, yeah, she did have a collection of jewels which she was able to pass on to her descendants. Yes. Do we have time for one last question, maybe? Okay, so uh, doesn't the English crown have a piece with rubies belong uh, to Josephine? The English crowns with the pieces belonging to Josephine. That's possible. I can't think of the actual which crown you're referring to. What, what, what I know that there's ru there's rubies. Uh, there's actually the Black Prince's ruby, which is a spinel. Which is a spinel. Which there is on the imperial crown and the imperial crown of India. There's some of the um, of the uh, there's some some from of Burma. the rubies from Burma, etc. Uh, for Josephine, the collection of the British crown jewels is so huge. Yeah. It probably is. Yeah. If anyone in the chat knows the answer to that question, you can help us. We've been also very fascinated by this tiara uh, worn by Elizabeth, which also can be worn as a, as a necklace. And we, you find a very, very similar exemplar also in the sale in 1887. And since it was sold, a lit, uh, I think two or three years after, um, uh, given to her, uh, I think it's, it's, it could be also a clue. Um, which major difference do you notice between the crown jewels then and now? Well, most of them, we, we, we have, you mean the, the actual French crown jewels? I don't know. Which major difference do you know? Jewels, well, yeah. as you heard, the jewels were sold, they were stolen. Some have been, uh, been come back to us, thankfully. And actually, our biggest clue of what they looked like is what we have in the Louvre right yeah. now. There's 23 pieces, and we encourage you all to go see them when the Louvre reopens again uh, very soon in the, in the Apollo Gallery. And the jewels actually, the interesting thing about these jewels, the French crown jewels, especially as they were transformed each time there was a new king or a new queen, and so they actually, the style changed over the, over yeah. the years. But what actually is always very interesting to me is the, the actual quality of the stones. Yeah. The actual, they had a, a, a very, imagine that ruby parure that we showed you, 400 yeah. carats of rubies. Can you imagine today yeah. finding 400 carats? Yeah. It would just be impossible. Yeah. So again, these, these crown jewels uh, are very sumptuous and they're incredibly uh, rare. And we're actually, the few that we have that the French uh, museums and have been able to take back. It's been a quite moving and very good experience. All right. So if you have any more questions, don't hesitate to ask. We'd be uh, uh, more than happy to answer them through uh, social networks. And uh, so we give you, uh, uh, we see you on the next, uh, on our next conference. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Leonard. And thank you, everyone, for coming to join us. It's been a really interesting evening. Absolutely. Bye. Bye-bye.